Joined now by Sean Callahan of Husker Online and Dylan Riola Watch continues because everybody's very excited about the freshman QB at Nebraska. But Sean, I'm I'm gonna start on the more established side of the ball on defense. How have, how has Nebraska's defense looked through the first few weeks of practice? Well, I, I think it's a pretty good unit. You know, the the one question was linebackers. They lost two veterans and Nick Henrich and and Luke Reimer, and and I feel like they've actually got a chance to be just as good or better with what they have in there. But their defensive line is strong. It's deep. They have all the veterans back, and then they have very good young talent. But Nash Hutmacher, Ty Robinson, Jamari Butler, um, you know, are all veteran fifth, six-year type players in this program. And then on the back end of the defense in the 3-3-5 in that secondary, um, they have a really good group of seven or eight defensive backs that can play those five positions um, so I think it's a, a a unit, you know, and it just depends on how some of these games go, but they can be easily a top 15 level national defense statistically, uh, especially with Tony White back. And I think John Butler coming in from the Buffalo Bills, as tough as that timing was, lose Evan Cooper. He's been a great addition um, being the secondary coach for the number one ranked defense in the NFL a year ago. Well, and the Butler addition is a really interesting one because obviously the Cooper firing happened at a very inopportune time, but Butler's in a strange situation. He left the bills because he got passed over for the DC job. He wants to be a play calling defensive coordinator and basically drop down a level because I would assume the idea is if he does well here and Tony white gets a head coaching job, he's probably calling plays for Nebraska and then he can prove himself as a play caller. Yeah, there's no question. I think that path was laid out or he anybody knows that there's really not a internal candidate on Matt Rule's staff before John Butler got here. That's a slam dunk to replace Tony White. Um, Evan Cooper was always a name that you heard mentioned possibly as he grew as a coach. Um, but, you know, Tony White, when you look at it now, he was very close to becoming UCLA's head coach <laughs> after um, watching Big Ten media days. I mean, I think he would have been just fine on that podium and uh, would have given a little bit better of an opening address than Foster. But, you know, he he was a candidate for the San Diego State head job. He was a candidate, obviously, for UCLA. Lincoln Riley knocked on his door to be his defensive coordinator at USC. And if he puts together another good year in Lincoln, there's no doubt his name is going to fall again on some of these head coaching lists. So let's, let's transition to the offense because the, the defense feels like it is in very good hands. Uh, Reading through what you guys wrote off the scrimmage on Saturday, it seems like the O line is is definitely not as deep as they'd hoped it would be. What what has been going on there? Well, they've had. I mean, they came into camp with seven linemen that have started Power Five or Power Four or Nebraska games. So that's a good number. I mean, yeah, you'd be hard pressed to find any programs that have more. Oh, you'll take it. And uh, after that, they lost one of those guys, Teddy Prochaska. He, he got out for the year, so they're down to six. Then. Uh, to, uh, one of their lower guys of that group, Henry Latoski, got hurt. He's out two or three weeks. They're down to five. Turner Corcoran, who missed last year for part of last season with an injury, he's back, but they're kind of limiting in his work. So they, they're playing with four of those best seven right now. And then I would say there's a fairly big drop-off when you start to get to that next group because they're younger players that have not played Big Ten football, particularly at the tackle position. Uh, Gunnar Gatula and Grant Segrin, two redshirt freshmen, have been getting live reps with left tackle, and they're going against a veteran defensive line of players in practice. So I do think that is the the concern. But if Turner Corcoran gets back, he started over 30 games in his career as a left tackle, they'll be fine. The right tackle, Bryce Benhart, has started over 40 games in his career. They brought in Micah Mazuka, a 30-some game starter, and he's going to be a guard. Ben Scott is a 30-40 game starter at center. They have a very good group. And then Justin Jenkins will be the other guard, and he played a lot and started some games last year. Then Leposki will be back. So as long as Corcoran can just give them a serviceable presence, I'm not saying they need this guy to be all world. They're going to be fine. But that that's, he's a big part of this discussion because I do think it's a significant drop-off if Turner Corcoran is at all limited this year. Well, and so we went on over the show yesterday. We were going over Deion Sanders' press conference, which is – you know, a lot of it was just weird, but it, like if you read between the lines of that, you could tell he loves the defensive line, especially the edge rushers they have. And so when I was reading through 
your practice reports, I was like, ooh, that could be a, a, a pretty interesting matchup because like BJ Green, Dayon Hayes, Samuel Okanola, very good group at Colorado if they can pick on somebody inexperienced at Nebraska. But like you said, if Turner's back, then that's probably not that big of a deal. But that that's a matchup to watch because I like my my read on that press conference was this is a guy who loves his D-line and does not seem particularly confident in his O-line. We, we, we just talked about Nebraska's D-line. Like that, that could be a game where both quarterbacks are, uh, are running around quite a bit. One, well, and they have other, like their tight ends are really good at Nebraska. So, you know, the, they can be creative and use those tight ends because they have three really good blocking tight ends and they mm. have three running backs that have played a lot of football that are very good in pass protection. So um, I'm sure you can scheme it up um, if there's an issue there and you know Colorado is going to load up a left side or a right side and go after your tackle play, um, you know, Nebraska is going to figure it out. And Dylan Riola, one thing he's good at doing, I've heard, is checking out a place, throwing it away. He's not going to force much. Um, he, for a freshman, it's rare to have the maturity and the poise that he's already shown um, thus far in his career and practices. Well, and after the Jeff Sims experience to open the season last year, I'm sure Nebraska fans are are just they don't want to think about a quarterback throwing it willy nilly. Like they they need to know somebody's going to put it in the dirt if there's no nobody open. Yeah, just throwing it up to Tyler Nubbin, uh, who was Minnesota's <laughs> best player in the opener. I mean, Nebraska. You think about some of the games they lost. I mean, they had complete control. They forced PJ Fleck to throw it 35 times in the second half. That's the most by far he's ever done in his career because they could not run the ball. That's how well Nebraska's defense was playing in Minneapolis against a very run-first offense that P.J. Fleck operates with, but they still figured out a way to blow it with interceptions and a late fumble by Anthony Grant. Um, and that the season kind of uh, turned. I mean, even at Colorado, they had control of that game in the midway port of the second quarter, and then the the, the turnovers came. Like and, the, yeah, the wheels just fell off at the end of the second quarter, and it looked like a completely different game after that. Yeah, the, the defense was playing physical. They sacked Shador Sanders eight or nine times. I mean, they they were they had the right recipe going in there, making yeah. Colorado play a Big Ten style of a football game. But when you turn it over two or three times quickly, like Nebraska did, you know, Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter and those guys, they, they, they were just too good. You can't give them that many free opportunities. So who gets the bulk of the carries for Nebraska this year? It's going to be a mix. I mean, I think Emmett Johnson and Ramir Johnson, it could be like 55-45. With Gabe Irvin Jr. could still come in there as, as a pounder. They need Gabe Irvin Jr. to prove he's healthy and durable. He's had multiple injuries. He is a true kind of bell cow, 230-pound, 225-pound type back. Ramir Johnson's a six-year senior that's played a lot of football. And then Emmett Johnson kind of assumed the job last year when both those guys got hurt. So, I think it's going to be a combination of those three where there might be 40 some carries on a good game where those guys will split those carries. Well, and, and that's my question. Cause you, you mentioned that, that Dylan Riola seems to be pretty judicious with the ball. How much will the play calling affect that even more? Do you think they're going to try to run it as much as they can get him comfortable, get in a situation where he's throwing, you know, into a situation where there, there's a heavier box and, and more one-on-one -on -one matchups, or do they, are there going to be times where they have to just kind of let him let it rip? A little bit of everything. I mean, they, they'll still run RPO, I think, um, but he'll just get rid of the ball and throw it um, or, or do the handoff. I don't think you'll see him just take off and run it a ton um, because they don't want him doing that. I mean, he can do it, but it's just not smart uh, when, when you look at him and, and, and what he's able to do as a thrower. Um, his ability to see the field, though, and throw over the top of coverage. I mean, I've heard stories from the defensive coaches. They're like, they're in the exact right call, and he's been able to throw the ball still over the top and make a perfect throw. Um, so he's got arm talent we've probably not seen at Nebraska uh, in a long, long time. It's a matter of can they protect him. And, um, you know, I think the schedule helps, too. UTEP being in the yeah. opener. Um, Colorado, we know that's going to be a, it's going to be electric, but Northern Iowa, they've got a really good runway to kind of build this thing up with Colorado coming into maybe one of the toughest atmospheres Memorial Stadium is going to present in a long time. So it, it, the limited sample size we saw of Dylan Rail in the spring game, the thing that I was intrigued by most, I think, are the the different arm slots that he seems very natural throwing from. And I realize that that's something that young quarterbacks are just doing more and more now, but it seemed pretty natural for him. 
And how did how did he develop that? Because like we know with Patrick Mahomes, that's the 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 guy who everybody's trying to emulate. He learned it playing baseball, and that's where it came from. But for Dylan Raiola, was it just trying to develop these because he's watching pro quarterbacks do it? Yeah, it's a little I mean, just like Mahomes. Dylan Raiola was an elite baseball player. Um, okay, he, all right. He could have been a Division One baseball player. He was a catcher, um, and when he first came to Nebraska as a recruit. Um, as a freshman, he was still playing high level prospect baseball. And and that was like the sport that he grew up playing. And then he evolved into a quarterback like he like he is now. But that was down in Texas. Um, but he trains, interesting enough, with both of Mahomes trainers, Bobby Strope in Kansas City. He's gone down there and worked with him um, a number of times. And then Jeff Christensen, the quarterback guru in Fort Worth, Texas, he's gone down there and he does you know, a couple, two, three workouts a year down there with Jeff Christensen. He actually flew Nebraska's receivers down to Fort Worth to work out with him and Jeff Christensen um, for that deal. And that's the world of NIL now where your starting quarterbacks making that kind of money that they can yep. flip the bill for not just dinner anymore. They can do trips or, or whatever it takes to, to build. Hey, hey, Minnesota's quarterback did it. We, we talked to him. He's the, you know, the transfer from New Hampshire. And he's like, yeah, I brought, brought all my receivers down and my, they hung out with my parents at the lake in Georgia. I was like, oh, yeah, guess we can just do that now. Yeah, it's a different world when you hear. I mean, just the cars, the clothes. I mean, these guys have a way different college experience than obviously even five or eight years ago. I mean, let alone 20, 30 years ago. Well, it, it's funny you mentioned the, the Dylan Rayola catcher thing. Uh, I, I'm sure there are some some eagle-eared viewers, listeners who are like, I know of a quarterback who is a catcher. That'd be Tom Brady, very famously a catcher in high school. Matthew Stafford. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard. I did. The, was there a famous pitcher who played with him? Well, and guess in, who in was high Matthew Stafford's center in Detroit? Dominic Raiola. <laughs> there you go. So, this is such a such a small sporting world, but it is. I mean, this is a ton of hype for a freshman, and we're we're not even talking about like, is he going to start or anything like that. It just feels like it's it's sort of decided. Right. Yeah. Rule has not said it, but it's very obvious to anybody that's around the program, the way he carries himself. Look, Heinrich Harburg was last year's starter. He took over and he won all five of Nebraska's games for them. Um, and, and, you know, that's a good backup, a guy to have in there. He's athletic enough to do other things, too. If they wanted Heinrich Harburg um, to, to be a wildcat or, you know, take on some other roles, he has that ability to, to do those things too. Um, so they've got a good situation in that quarterback room. And it's very hard to have that in the transfer portal era of college football to have two or three quarterbacks on your roster that you feel good about right now. So Sean, I'm going to ask you the same question. I've asked uh, some of the folks that we've talked to from the other team sites and, and li probably a little bit different answers from Ohio state and Georgia and Alabama. I think you have a little more to choose from here, but, of the games on Nebraska's schedule, what's the one that most of your Husker Online subscribers would say, this is a gimme win, sure thing, that you're looking at and going, hmm, I'm not so sure. And, and let's take out the UTEP at Northern Colorado game. That's just too easy to, to go with those. Right, we're not doing that. Yeah. Um, I, I'll say Rutgers. It's a home game. It's homecoming. Uh, Nebraska has never lost to Rutgers since they've joined the Big Ten. That's the only Big Ten team they still have an undefeated record against in the 14 years now that have been in the conference. Um, but Rutgers with Greg Schiano, um, they have a great schedule. They have the leading rusher in the Big Ten returning. Um, they will be physical. They will get after Dylan Raiola. They have the chance to try to make that an ugly game and, and win in Lincoln. I, I think that's a game of Nebraska's first seven games, Andy. Rutgers is the only opponent Nebraska plays in the first seven that was in a bowl game a year ago. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, and one thing to watch, because you'll get a good taste of Rutgers. They go to Lane Stadium, play Virginia Tech on September 21st. Virginia Tech's going to be a pretty good team. Like if Rutgers can go in there and beat Virginia Tech, that's where worry. Worry about that game especially. But I, I think that's a, a matchup of two very experienced defenses, and it'll be a good test for Nebraska's offense. Well, yeah, and look at Rutgers' overall Big Ten schedule. They don't play Michigan. They don't play Ohio State. They don't play Oregon. Yep. They don't play Penn State. And they don't play Iowa. 
they are the only team in the conference that does not play any of the top five preseason teams. Um, so there, there's some tiebreakers out there where Rutgers could put themselves in the discussion yeah. because they don't play anybody. And we actually don't, I, as far as I know, Andy, we don't know the tiebreakers yet other than head to head for nope. the Big Ten Conference and, and or the SEC. And I believe the two leagues are working together uh, to kind of develop a uniform tiebreaker system because that will be a very big deal to win your conference now going forward. Very much so. And if the playoff happens to expand to 14, like it's been suggested it will in a couple of years, those tiebreakers may have the effect on who gets the buys or who has a chance to get the buys in the playoff, the only buys in the playoff. So, yeah, I I would expect them to, to work together. But you're right. They have not told us that. The one thing that, that we've been told is uh, Mark Womack from the SEC has said that it would not be – college football playoff ranking related because that doesn't come out till Tuesday and the league needs to know Sunday, which teams are playing in its championship game. Which is interesting because like there's a scenario where Rutgers could easily go 10 and two and mm-hmm. they could be in a position where they're tied with some other teams. I mean, Iowa too. I think Iowa has a schedule that could vault. That, that's, up. that's the one Sean I'm, I'm curious about because I think the the Iowa Nebraska game at the end of the year for Iowa because they they do get Ohio State but they don't get any of those other teams you talked about for Iowa that could mean a playoff berth it could mean a potential Big Ten championship game we'll see I mean we'll see what the how the offense looks yeah you we don't even know who's going to play quarterback at this point other than Ohio State you tell me a game on there where Iowa's an underdog. They're favoring all of them, except maybe Nebraska at the end of the season, depending on how Nebraska plays. And and that game in Iowa City is going to be a night game on NBC. So it should really be some appointment viewing for a lot of fans to watch that game on Black Friday on NBC at night. Um, it, it's got a chance to be a really great stage. It's usually been an 11 a.m. kind of a yeah. sleepy Thanksgiving hang- hangover. It's been the, the Big Ten Network's kind of signature game the last – few years like they, they would it would be on btn on black friday in the afternoon and that would be the the big one for btn for the entire year and now we get wisconsin and minnesota on black friday as well as <laughs> iowa nebraska so it's a it's a pretty good slate they're gonna have two black friday big 10 games every year um, which i think will help the viewership of the big 10 games that weekend because you know minnesota wisconsin buried on the saturday with ohio state michigan it, it was always kind of tough to get that in the schedule well, and that's been a fun one the last couple of years. When, when, like when Minnesota a few years ago finally broke that streak against Wisconsin, it it got buried by other games that are going on in that giant rivalry Saturday. So that that is a really good spot to put that game in. Uh, but yeah, the and I'm I'm glad that I think was it Sean Eichhorst who was going to try to move that game off of uh, off of Black Friday. Uh, I'm glad that the Nebraska fans rose up and made sure that didn't happen. I mean, that was a he pretty much was one of the things that pushed him out the door. That decision to do that, and if not for COVID in 2020, when because they were supposed to play Minnesota on Black Friday in 2020, uh, that had been arranged. Uh, but then because of the schedule changes that happened in 2020, they were able to kind of alter it to allow Nebraska and Iowa to play Black Friday in an empty stadium in Iowa City that I was at uh, for that game. So. Um, that yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, Nebraska and Iowa, this will be the 14th year in a row they've played on Black Friday. And Nebraska has a history of playing on Black Friday and Thanksgiving that goes all the way back to Oklahoma. Yeah. I, I can't wait for any of this. I, I just the 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 newness of it all and seeing these different matchups, like the idea that Nebraska plays USC in a conference game this year in the Coliseum in November is wild to me. And I, I personally, like, I love the time of year they drew this game because usually you're playing in Madison on that day if you're Nebraska. Yeah. You're playing somewhere. And so what does that mean? Maybe if Dylan Raiola can actually run his full arsenal of passing plays for four quarters versus we've seen games that time of year in this conference where half the game, the wind is so bad, you can't throw. <laughs> yep. Well, and, and Nebraska does not have to go to the uh, the new makeshift stadium at Northwestern, which speaking of the wind, that one – like, God bless any quarterback who has to play a game in that stadium. It is like Lake Michigan is 25 yards away. They're going to like let kids fish during the game or something. 
<laughs> off the show. It's going to be awesome. Like, I, it, I, I Wisconsin, Wisconsin would like the game is there. Like, Wisconsin Northwestern is at that stadium. I would love to see Nebraska play there just to see how their fans would take over this thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, it would be, be incredible because I think it's going to be like 15,000 seats, 20,000 seats. Yeah, it's uh, and and it's at least two seasons they're going to be playing in this thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, like, if it if Nebraska were coming, they put it at Wrigley because they like the Illinois game, and the Ohio State game, or Wrigley Field this year. But yeah, that the, well, here's a here's a hypothetical for you. And and you know, we've heard Lincoln Riley give a bunch of excuses this preseason that sounds to me like managing expectations. Like, if that doesn't go very well. How many, like, what will the percentage of fans be in the Coliseum in that game? Like, what percentage Nebraska fans will the Coliseum be? Oh, I mean, if the last time Nebraska played there, which was Bill Callahan in 2006, there was 25,000 plus Nebraska fans. And USC was awesome then. (laughs) That was Pete Pete Carroll, you know, a young Dominican Sioux playing for Nebraska and Marlon Lucky. And that, that, that was one of my favorite games I've ever been to, just the amount of people that travel, but anytime Nebraska has played in one of these new pac 12 of teams that have come in, they generally take 20 to 25,000 fans on those trips because there are so many Husker fans that are on the West coast. And this is their one game. They would generally go to. Well, I, that I'm fascinated to see where that, cause that, that could be if USC's defense is better then you could have a USC that is competing for a college football playoff berth. That is, that is, riding high where the the atmosphere for that game will be off the charts or if it goes badly it could be all nebraska fans and that will be just as weird yeah i i'm interested in their quarterback situation because i do think the kid they brought from unlv is a good quarterback and it would not surprise me if if he ended up at some point taking that job over there well, I think that's why he came because, yeah, my Ava was very good for UNLV last year. And you know, Miller Moss looked awesome in the bowl game. He looked in command, looked like he had the respect of his teammates, all that stuff. But that's one game. And we don't know where Louisville was at in that game. So we, we kind of need to see it. They're playing LSU. They'll play Michigan early. So we'll, we'll have a pretty good idea early where USC is on all this. But, but yeah, that, that is interesting because my Ava, remember, was committed to Georgia for a minute and then flipped over to USC, even though that job didn't seem open. So that, that tells you maybe there's a possibility. And I, I there's some coaches I know in the Mountain West, and they said Maeva was the best player in their league in terms of like upside and, and long term. So it's no mistake that USC and Georgia were the two teams. And I think Miami um, kicked the tires on him as well. And I mean, he, he yeah. um, played their bowl game, though, which was kind of a surprise because uh, it looked like he was going to leave before their bowl and played the bowl, then, then went in the portal. Yeah, I, I am very interested to see how some of these QB situations shake out because they, they've they not – they seem clear now, but after a couple of games, they might get muddy. Uh, meanwhile, Nebraska, do, do you expect Rule to name Raiola the starter or do you expect it to just be he comes out in the UTEP game? So I think they'll name – they'll put a depth chart out is my guess, but – they'll have one more week of training camp this week. And it wouldn't surprise me after this week, if they kind of define things a little bit clearer, Um, you know, you don't have to worry now about players transferring in August. I can remember when Scott Frost really battled. Do I name Tristan? Do I name Martinez the starter over Tristan Jebby? What do I do it? Well, he did it at the absolute latest. You could the, the, the Sunday or whatever, before the game against Akron, well, Jebbia was in the portal the next day and there was enough time for him to get to Oregon state and leave. You can't do that anymore. Um, So that is one advantage the coaches have because you used to have to kind of worry about there was time for guys to go on the portal and land somewhere and preserve their eligibility, especially if a school was in the quarter system. Tristan Jebby, by the way, whose college career ended last year at Ohio state. (laughs) He's older than us. I mean, that guy, I mean, he, he literally um, was at Nebraska um, back in the Mike Riley era. I, he's got to be a doctor by now. That's all I know. <laughs> it's incredible. Sean Callahan, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Andy. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, 
Subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.